Hi, everyone. All right. I'm going to get comfortable if you don't mind. Um, all right. So I'm going to stand up. I'm sorry, camera people don't hate me. Uh, I broke my leg and sitting hurts. So uh, as a starting point, this room is amazing. Yo, like we got to give it up for the Greek organizing team who put together a phenomenal venue and <laughs> such a good place, like mad props. Um, all right. So as a starting point, I kind of want to get a sense of where we're all at so we can have the right conversation. All right, so, so limber up a little. I'm going to ask you some questions. I actually want you to move your body. Uh, raise your hand if this is where you're at. You've heard a lot of noise about AI, but you've never actually used any of it, and you're just like, I'm here to figure out what's what. That's you. Don't be shy. It's okay. All right, cool. What about if you've used like an AI generative chat tool like GPT or BARD periodically, here and there? Like you went in, you're like, where should I go in Greece, chat GPT? And it said, oh, you should go to Peloponnesia. Um, all right, cool. What about if you've assisted, used an like AI assisted tool in your work? Maybe Copilot to help code or uh, image generation? All right. What if you've actually built AI into your end-facing products, your work, you've created and trained models? Wow, okay, we've got a really good spread, surprisingly good, which means this conversation is gonna have to flow at all altitudes. Uh, if you're not sure what's going on, just like put it in social and somebody will shout it and we'll, we'll roll with that. Okay, so why are we here? Let's start with that and then, and then we'll go into a conversation. This is not a theoretical high-flying conversation. We're not going to talk about what, what we are going to focus on is real and tangible examples of how AI is being used in WordPress today, things that we want to happen in AI now, soon, so that you can walk out of here and go to the next six AI sessions and be like, cool, I want to do this. I heard about how do I do it? And you can practically and tangibly start to execute this stuff. So this, this is like a product conversation, not a technical conversation. We're not going to get into the how. We're going to talk about the what and uh, look for concepts and ideas. When we're talking about what AI, just to frame, because that's actually a real big catch-all term that means lots and lots and lots and lots of things. Um, what we're really going to talk about today are generative language models. These are like services like ChatGPT that you can engage with. They've captured a ton of data and can parse and create new ideas with it. And we'll talk a little bit about specialized models that people are using to execute specific tasks. Is there any, any other sort of things that fall under the AI? That, no? Good? All right. Sweet. So what we're going to do, we're going to go and do some quick intros. I've asked each of these folks, these folks are here because they have stuff in the wild. They've been actively using, launching, executing uh, products for consumers, for their internal teams, using AI, and we just want to talk about them. Um, so from that perspective, Mike Sujay, make the most of it. If he goes over two minutes, I'm going to start making weird sounds. Hey all, uh, this is uh, Sujay Pawar. I run a company called Brainstorm Force. Uh, I'm a CEO and co-founder. We have a bunch of products. Uh, the flagship one is Astra Theme, which is the most used, uh, one of the most used now theme uh, in the WordPress repository, about 2 million installations. So one of the things uh, people use Astra is for building their website, launching their website. Uh, we solve the onboarding problem for users where uh, without a product like ours, uh, if people are going in a traditional route, people have to <coughs> install a theme, install a bunch of plugins, start with a blank screen, and start their website from scratch. So uh, we help people have the first version of their website ready. Uh, so with AI, like our mission is to help people build their website in as little clicks and as little time as possible. So uh, that's what we are really focused on. We have been working on this for like uh, past one and a half year. Uh, and AI has been, you know, evolving a lot. So we have made multiple iterations of the product. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's pretty exciting time, I believe. And thanks, Shen. Yeah, well, you've got some actual 
AI products that like SureWriter yeah. and a handful of products that you can go out and use today and they are powered and facilitated by AI. Absolutely. Yeah. So I wanted to focus on just one product. So oh. yeah, and that's the biggest one. Okay. <laughs> but he's got lots of them. Cool. <laughs> Hello, I'm Constance. I'm based out of Austin, Texas, and I work for Big Commerce. So we create e-commerce platforms. We create a platform for people to create their websites, their stores. And I actually am the relations manager. This is working? Okay. I manage the team that establishes relations with the developer. We create all the documentation and we want to create an awesome developer experience. So really I'm developer focused and our connection is to WordPress. We offer WordPress plugin and most of the folks I talked with today, they are, oh yeah, we know, big commerce. AI, for us in the beginning, it was a buzzword and as a company, we've really been trying to narrow it down because it has huge potential for e-commerce in many different ways that we are trying to explore. Also for our developer communities, uh, we actually just introduced an AI section in our marketplace to enable developers to develop AI applications. In addition, my company also acquired Feedonomics uh, through an M&A. In Feedonomics, they are pretty much autonomous, but they have one important product called Feed AI uh, that focuses on feed optimization, which is a huge thing for product categorization. And I'm super excited to be here with everybody. Just personally, I love to play around with Codepilot and all these kind of things, and really looking forward to this conversation. Hi, I'm Shane. Uh, I wear a number of hats. I'm a VP at Liquid Web. I'm president at Modern Tribe. Uh, and we do a lot of R&D for a number of different brands. So from an AI perspective, we uh, are going to be launching uh, Cadence AI in this weekend, next week, really, really, really soon. Uh, we've got brands like LearnDash that just put out their first AI plugin, which creates course outlines. Uh, we've got one that's about to create quizzes. It'll tear through your course and build out. Uh, and there's an entire framework to allow a lot of our product suites to leverage it and, and move forward. So that's coming as well as support. And we'll talk about a lot of the others soon. Hi there, my name is Daniel. I am director of product development at SiteGround. And at SiteGround, we've been using AI for years now, before the boom of AI. We do incorporate AI into some of the products that we do, and also internally in the company for development, for pretty much cutting the costs of many things. One of the things that uh, we've been using AI for quite some time now is actually translating our website in many languages that uh, we sell in different countries. And also we do provide support through the help of AI. So that helped us a lot. In terms of uh, other things which are not so WordPress specific because we're a web hosting company, we do also use AI for content classification. When you think of spam email messages that we want to block, when you think of um, spam commands that people get on their websites. So that's also something that we're doing right now. And of course, with the boom of uh, generative AI, we are now into that fast lane where we want to help people get started with a website and say, hey, I want a website. There you go. That's the topic. And after that, easily manage that through the help of AI. But we'll cover all those topics later. It's not picking her up. Oh, should I try again? Here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Hi. So I am Gabriella Laster. I am a product marketing manager at Elementor. And in the past few couple of months, actually, I have been responsible for launching our new AI products. So at Elementor, what we do is we make website building more accessible. So we had the drag and drop builder, and I think we're doing something similar with AI. So we are making 
AI accessible within our builder. We were actually the first ones, I think, to introduce AI into a page builder. So we've already integrated the ability to generate text. You can add a heading to your website. You can change the tone. You can translate as well to different languages. Um, but what I think was also really cool that we added was the ability to generate custom code, custom CSS, HTML. So we've seen people use it to even create their own widgets. And what we're trying to do is make that accessible for people who don't necessarily know how to use AI. So we are integrating it within our product and making it easier for other users. We have engineered it also to make it, any prompt you make, it knows that it is, op that it is operating within a website. So it is already engineered to give you results that are more appropriate for your website. And we're actually going to be launching a new product actually within the week, I hope. Um, we're integrating AI for image generation as well. So we are going to make it easier for users to just describe what they want to create. They can edit images. They can customize images. We are thinking of the web creators. So what we're doing is also enabling them to change the aspect ratio, enlarge it, giving them all the tools they need to create their websites at scale, to create content at scale, to improve their workflow. And we've been doing that for the past couple of months. Our chief product officer has actually been working on AI for the past year behind the scenes. So he's very knowledgeable when it comes to where AI can go in the website building space. All right. So we've got a mix here. We've got hosting. We've got SaaS e-commerce businesses. We've got WordPress plugin businesses and, and services. Um, there's a lot of place that we're actually seeing AI start to show up. And, I, and I'm going to travel across the ecosystem. Um, gi given Gabby's comment, why don't we start with themes and website setup? That seems to be like one of the most common places we mm -hmm. see people going like, well, one of the biggest challenges in creating a website is the blank page. You know, a user shows up and they're like, what do I do? It's like having a giant bucket of Legos poured in front of you. And so AI has this opportunity to start to bridge that gap, and people are approaching it really differently. And so I'm, I'm curious if you talk about how you're approaching that problem and, um, and what, what's on the roadmap ahead. Like, what, what isn't being done? What could be done? Where, where does this actual particular trend of website building go as AI evolves? Do you want me to take it? Do it. So I, I think we don't really know where it's going because it does change on a daily basis. But I think we need to, I think it's going to change experiences. It's going to change how people interact with websites. It's going to change how people consume content, how people generate content. Um, you started, you said by people have, it becomes overwhelming to start a website from a blank page. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, when I started using AI, before I learned anything about prompt engineering, I would ask a question and I would get horrible results. But that would even that helped me understand what direction I did want to go. And so all of a sudden it became a little less overwhelming. It focuses you on what you want to achieve. Although I I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna be an attendee and a moderator. Uh, although I would argue that right now we're in this really weird early stage, not a critique to element or apologize. I think what you guys are doing is awesome. Um, where people are just shoving prompt spaces in and then expecting users to figure out how to get the AI to do what it want, which is weird and sort of a half step because the reality is most of us kind of already know what they want. You ask any freelancer, hey, you need to build a church site, a community site, a small business site, the patterns are so well established. And really the differences between them are small personal differences. And through a really good interview onboarding process, you can get to the point where that structure, that site map, the content can be laid out in a way that is 80, 90% of the way there. And then the person puts their own unique touch on it. Um, where, where do we go from having more than just a prompt place where I can fill a block, you know, I mean, Human Made did this really great block thing, Automatic is doing the writer, you know, there are a lot of products we're starting to show up, but they're really just like, how do I have chat GPT in my website? Um, what's the next step beyond that? In terms of site building? Yeah, in I, terms of site building. I pretty much think that we have to get metadata from the users in terms of, a, let's say, getting started where you 
put a form or another way to get the metadata from the user and they mm -hmm. say, okay, so I'm based in, let's say, San Diego right. and my target users are those target users and uh, I like those colors and that's my brand identity. So you go through that process and after that the AI pretty much helps you to get the layout you want. It gives you a couple of choices there. You yeah. pick one and after that it learns from what you have picked in order to design your other pages like the contact page for example. So that's the next step for me because prompt engineering as you've said people don't get it like it's a whole different process there like you have to think more but end users like the the end users the people building the websites if you get the information that they don't know specifically it's going to be useful for the site building process then you're going to cut the time in generating a really nice website for them yeah, or it could be as simple as uh, not staring at a blank screen when you are trying to design a landing page for your business or a marketing campaign, right? So it could be as simple as, uh, you know, I mean, uh, right now when you have to create a landing page, you have to click many buttons, find out the exact block that you want or widget that you want or whatever, right, uh, of your page building tool. So it could be as simple as uh, there is a, you know, a button, you click a button, you tell AI like what kind of landing page that you are building, and out of the database or whatever it has, uh, the patterns it has, it can put up a really nice landing page with the pillar content that you can improve upon and take it ahead rather than staring at a blank screen. So we're, we're making this assumption, at least I was until just recently, we're making this assumption that this process starts in WordPress, but I don't think we're all that far away from the process, you know, whether you're actually going to a generative AI, I call it an agent or a tool that enacts things for you. But I mean, they're gonna be built into ROS real soon. They'll be built into our browsers. And so being able to be like, Bard, I need a website for my kid's school. And Bard goes, all right, cool. Let me gather some quick information for you. Now let me generate. I think one of the interesting challenges we have as an open source community is, well, what's Bard gonna pick? What's ChatGPT gonna pick? Like, how, how does it go about through the decision process? I mean, last night, I, we were hanging out, and I was like, huh, hey, ChatGPT, I need to make a website. What should I use? And it gave me a huge list of like, well, you could use WordPress or Joomla, or blah, blah. and I was like, no, 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 I don't care, just pick something. And it came out, and it's like, well, then you should just use WordPress, which is awesome <laughs> and unexpected and kind of interesting. But what I really wonder is, how do we continue to build our platforms such that if the decision maker is an AI, not a freelancer, not a consumer, not somebody in this room, does the project need to evolve in a particular way that it is a good solution for an AI to build a site? My stake on it is that those AI agents that you are talking about if they're in the browser or the operating system, it doesn't really matter. When you ask them something and they're connected to part of the internet or know about a certain list of APIs, they will require those APIs to be very well structured, to have very good documentation so that the AI will understand what you want and then it will pick WordPress instead of, for, let's say, Drupal or Joomla or Wix because it knows that with that specific API of WordPress, I can achieve that and I can do it in a way that's going to fulfill the request of the user. So for me, that's a really inter interesting uh, approach of things, like how do we shape the APIs and documentation so that ChatGPT or BART or whatever understands that. I mean that. Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying because we work, you know, with developer documentation and APIs, picking it up. Yeah, yours. Um, uh, we have to. Basically, I believe we will come. Do you want to take mine? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll have to get to the point where we train our so docs. Grabbing the mute button, Did I, was I grabbing yeah. the mute button? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we have to train our documentation, our content to be picked up by AI. And um, I've seen this a lot because we manage a whole developer center for our platform. And uh, it's very actually hard for developers to discover what they need and we can train AI, we can train the APIs to pick that up. And that's how I see it at least in our business when it comes to developer, um, developer experience, 
we have to do exactly what you're saying. I mean, it's interesting because if you think about when Matt came up, you know, and I, we heard him recently, Sim Mullenweg recently say, learn AI deeply. Yeah. My first thought was, you know, probably the most important team in core is about to be the documentation team. <laughs> Just thinking if you want to go and actually have influence, they're fundamental to the future of the project. Yeah. All right, so, so we got site building, We've got like awesome future robots who are going to spin out sites for us. What, what else? What else is coming to? Where? What else, how else are you using it today? What else we got? We're using it internally, basically, to help our support teams, both the developer support and also the customer support, to right now basically yeah, get to the right documentation, uh, be able to answer support question, automate. Uh, support uh, uh, queries and all that, and that makes it very easy. And we're planning to also have it built into our support sites, into our developer site, so that our customers and also our engineers get to the right information more quickly and just really speed up the process and get targeted consumer information. So you're, wow, that's intense. Uh, you're an e-commerce business, and when people come ask for support, they're probably handing over potentially some pretty private or risky stuff, money stuff, data stuff, customer stuff, sometimes when you're debugging. If you're using AI, how are you doing it in a way that doesn't give you like PII or security problems? Like That's one of the tough issues for us, definitely. So first of all, uh, we're making sure that this information does not, uh, there is a way actually even to have a plugin and even with chat GPT where you can have it privately and it does not, it's not used for any future queries. So we're doing that. We're also really not using it so much for customers directly, but for our internal support teams <laughs> that they have that information and that it does not get outside our internal teams. I think that's super important. We have to gate the information, basically. Or otherwise, you have to make it clear to the customers, but make sure no private data is shared. It's challenging. Uh, how many of you? <laughs> oh, my God. How many of you are using it to support, to um, bolster your support teams, either helping them create better answers, understand translation, like actively today. How many of you? Yeah? Yeah, sure. So yeah, we're working on it. Cool. So are we. <laughs> uh, I mean, actually, to be fair, we're using it to consolidate and create a much better way to experience documentation. So we've been using a DocSpot little plug for Aaron Edwards plugin, which is really, really fascinating. If you want to try getting your own model and putting your own plugin customer product documentation in it. It'll create a chatbot. It's your own system. You got to train it, but it's a great WordPress project that came out a couple of months ago and it is, and I quote, big in Japan. Uh, <laughs> so, I swear it blew up. It's really interesting. Um, what, what about on the consumer facing side or any of you like direct interaction? Yeah, so on the consumer facing side where people get, uh, where people get to go to our support. So right now we do have uh, that quick help thing, which is inside their user area. And when you go there, people usually type just two words or DNS problem or cannot log in, something like that. So what we do there is, first of all, we give clear indication to the user that they can select an AI model to answer their question because there could be something written in there which they don't want to share, for example. So the user has the option to opt out and go for traditional support. So what we basically do, first we have a small model which tries to match the query of the user to our whole knowledge base and all of our tutorials. Once we find those matches that we know are super, super targeting that question, after that we get it as a context and we give it to an in-house model which is based on GPT-3 and after that, we generate a reply, which is kind of sort of generated as if by an operator. 
And if the user gives a thumbs up or thumbs down, we can train the model so it gets better next time. And after that, of course, they can go to a real human if they don't want to. This may be too technical, and we can pause it, but how do you train the model? Because like user thumbs up and thumbs down are complicated. It could be like, that's a weird answer. It could be like, I don't like that answer, which doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's not what they were hoping for. Yeah, you need to get some more context after that. So we tend to get part of that data and after that run surveys. So it's not all the thumbs up or all the thumbs down, like we're gonna contact you additionally, but percentage of those, we do send them uh, a survey so they can fill it out and give more information about why they ranked it up or why they did not like the answer. So that's yeah, how we, we get more information. I think also, for those of you who are playing with it, a lot of them tend to try just a smiley face, frowny face, thumbs up, thumbs down, but that's gonna give you a fake answer. We've been playing with, did this answer make sense? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like get way more targeted so that the answer you're getting is actually helpful as opposed to like, well, I'm frust I came in frustrated and I'm still frustrated, which is like, that happens sometimes. Um. But I, I think also that's where it you have to test it internally because AI doesn't always give you the answers you expect it to. Or right ones. Or the right ones. <laughs> um, it gives you sometimes the very wrong answers in a very convincing way. So it's important to, to test that, to evaluate random samples and make sure that it's giving you the answer that it wants to. And if it's not, to train it to bring, provide a better answer. So relying on people's feedback at scale, that's great because generally when you're working with larger numbers, that will give you a better insight. But also it's very important to review the own review the answers occasionally yourself to really make sure that people aren't just filling out some random content just to close the conversation bubble. They don't want to deal with it, they're lazy, they just want out. So there's also some manual work involved. Yeah, so one thing that we're experimenting right now with in order to get it to the next level is that we're putting a bot inside of the view that our support agents see on our end. So how would AI reply to that question and how I reply? So like newbies, for example, they can get the information from the knowledge base if they're not familiar with the topic or experienced operators, they can see that the AI is pretty much talking nonsense so they can mark it as, okay, that's not fine. So that's another way to train it internally. That's a great idea. Yeah. It's like copilot for customer support. Exactly, where you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Um, probably the first place that I personally used AI, although I mean, I'm sure out here almost everybody, you just probably weren't thinking it was, was Google Translate and eventually DeepL and some of these others. Uh, are any of you, I know you mentioned it, are any of you leveraging translation as part of creating products, as part of interacting with support, and, and how is that evolving? I mean, we haven't uh, tried it for the translation because, uh, I mean, I, English is not my first language, so I have the first-hand experience with the translation. So whenever I try to translate something, at least for my language, I, I like speak four languages, and still Google Translate itself is not as good with the translations. It oftentimes makes mistakes, so I'm like a bit doubtful about that, like uh, what kind of experience my customers would have. So for example, like you know, a simple, what is a theme? A theme can have like different meanings, right? Like theme in the WordPress, concept is a very different and it can mean something else. So I'm a little bit conservative on that. So I haven't tried AI for the translation, but I'm like, you know, very happy to see like how it is working for side ground and that makes me or gives me some confidence to try it out for our teams as well. You wanna talk us through that? Yeah, so we've been using AI for translating our website, which is not a tiny website. So we do have a lot of things to translate and in the beginning, it was a rough ride, I'm not gonna lie. Like, it was generating things that do not sound correct in German or French or Spanish, but with time, we figure out ways how to improve that. So, for example, when there are many technical terms in tutorials, knowledge base, or even on, on sales pages, and it doesn't do good, what we figure out that we can do is we can get the translations from Firefox. So. For example, you can get a ton of technical terms translated properly there, like SSL certificates, encryption, SSL, yeah. yeah, and stuff like that. 
and that helped a lot to increase the accuracy of the translations. And after that, of course, we have people that speak Spanish and Italian and German and French. We had them give feedback about that. So internally, it's about not believing that you're going to get the perfect translations, but a year from now, if you start, you're going to get very good translations. Wait, how does that work? So you're saying you've got like Google Translate, and then on top of it, you feed it through like a small model you built yourselves? Or so we are using Google Translate, but not the free version of it. Yeah. So we're using the paid version, obviously. And after that, once we generate the pages, uh, we do have a small model which is used by our internal people that are translating. So they're giving feedback for every string that we have in our link application and they're changing it so every time you're typing in that field we're sending feedback to that small model and after that we bring up tons of VMs with uh, uh, with cards in order to train the model again so it takes time and it takes expertise but we're lucky to have an AI team of uh, four PhDs so <laughs> we're not an SMB here yeah, yeah. Uh, so to me where that gets interesting is are you using that as well to power customer conversations and support? Yeah, so right now, if uh, we don't have operators on shift that speak, for example, Spanish, and we have a Spanish-speaking client because we do provide support in Spanish, they come in, they type their support ticket in Spanish, we translate it through the models, and after that, uh, the operator writes in English, and we do translate the reply to the client in, uh, in Spanish. The cool thing about it is that at any time in our internal systems, you can see the two replies by each other, so you can see if the context is right and if the, the feeling is right there, and what you wanted to convey as an idea in the answer was actually done. So we do have people after that reviewing some of those. So I think, I mean, when we talk about what Sujay, Sujay said like, hey, I'm, I'm uncomfortable because I worry that I won't have the technical accuracy that I need, but if you look at, it, we are so global and the odds that somebody is providing, you've got a support person, the odds that they can work in their native language, and then whoever's asking for support can also work in their native language, and it's the same one is pretty low. And so most often what I tend to see is two different people who may not be native English speakers attempting to figure out WPCLI commands in English between each other, and like, that's the target, right? The target isn't native language to perfection. The target is, can we get the model to do a better job than two non-native English or two non-native speakers trying to work it out where it's literally more comfortable and more effective for them to work in their native language? You know, if, if he can be in, in Bulgarian and I can be in Spanish and the two of us can have a functional conversation without worrying about it, and if something's weird, we could be like, okay, what is that? That's... I mean, the staffing implications, the comfort and customer success implications are huge. Yeah, by the time people come to support, they have wasted probably a couple of hours to fix something, and they want their issue to be fixed. They don't want perfect native English speaker right. on the other end. They want their issue to be fixed, and if it's fixed, that's the most important thing for them. So that model, like, do we think that whether it's DeepL or Google, do we think they're going to get there technically? Or do you think like the WordPress community needs to make a, you know, as part of the documentation translation team can essentially build the linguistical layer we need for translate because WordPress is translated. Like it's got a huge translation team. We're doing a lot. Is this a gap that is a community we can fill and train the model? And then every SMB, every small plugin house, every small freelancer can have access to a translation tool that actually works better? I think that fine-tuning a model similar as Google Translate with the already translated core and uh, all the plugins and teams and everything, that's going to work out pretty well. I think that could be interesting. I don't know how that works. Yeah, I mean, uh, it works, but it, what I'm trying to say is uh, the translations work great, but it, go, it takes you till like 90%, 80%, 85%, somewhere like that. So even we internally translate our products uh, so that they are accessible in multiple languages, right? Uh, and we try to use the AI to translate them, but after that, we require a human touch so that we make sure that it is not translated in a very robotic or inaccurate way. And AI is getting smarter and smarter, so hopefully like that 80% or 90% will go to like 95, 97, whatever, but yeah, uh, still like I would say like 2%, 3%, like some sort of a human touch is uh, probably going to require. 
so that we verify if the translations are done accurately and in a way that uh, they will not rather confuse users rather than solving their problem. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, absolutely. I used to, when I was in college, I used to make money translating. I like you guys speak four languages, and I could never trust at first machine translation networks. But like for us in e-commerce, uh, there's a huge potential as we have the multi-geo, multi-regional website, multi-language which websites you could really use AI to do that job, to translate all the product descriptions and everything. But of course, there will always have to be the human touch. Of, I am hoping though for AI to do things like that, you know, convert like a pricing model or a shipping model. There's more than just translation, there's localization. Right. Um, that to me would be a great thing if we could utilize AI, because if you have a store in the US, it differs from yeah, a store in Germany with anything, taxes, uh, shipping zone, so that would be a cool aspect as well. So we haven't, we haven't talked about media yet. So I I image, video, sound, yeah. I know you just announced that like, media ahoy. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, what are the different ways that you're seeing uh, even just image generation, image uh, categorization being used that's, that's effective, besides like three arm babies and, and weird. I think it's gotten a lot better from where it started and it, it's getting better every single day. So you can, even if you're trying a tool like Mid Journey, if you tried it a month ago and you try it today, the results you're gonna get are very, very different. Um, I see it helping us create more content, more variations of content at great speed. So if, for example, I think we spoke about it yesterday, I'm not sure, it was in one of the conversations for sure, where we spoke of, you can have an e-commerce website, you're not, I think you mentioned about the photographer, you're not gonna need a photographer anymore, so that, that was your point. Photography, yeah. Yeah, but also creating variations. I don't need to take a picture of this shirt in five different colors, I can just instantly create it in five different colors. I don't need Photoshop, I don't need anyone else to take care of that for me. Um, but in addition to that, I think that over time, and this isn't, I think over time our expectations of content, media, and images is going to change. We are going to expect more extravagant images, more extreme images, because that, that's some of the capabilities that AI produces. So over time, we're going to expect that and want more of that. So I think our styles are going to change also. Over time, it's gonna take time, but I think our expectations and styles will also change. That would be pretty sweet. I have so many like half-assed photos that if I could just take my photo, feed it to AI, and it could be back and be like, here's a great product photo of nearly the same thing, and now I don't have to worry about copyright infringement, and I don't have to worry about, is this really my content? It's just elevating the quality of what I'm producing. Uh, it, Can you imagine in e-commerce, yeah, like you sell a shirt, like this shirt, and you sell it in five colors. You don't have to take the pictures anymore. I mean, so many things also uh, approaching different markets, different countries like different kind of product presentations, they uh, have different focuses. If you could use AI to provide those kind of background images or settings and have basically I was called localized uh, product pictures would be super. Also for websites, our, we use a lot of banners and everything. Have that AI generated. Yeah, honestly, banner generation would be Banner sweet. generation would be so sweet. Yeah. What, what about, so I, I, on our side, we produce, as an agency, our arm, we do a lot of work with government. We do a lot of work with education, where accessibility is really, really important. WordPress cares a lot about accessibility and puts a huge amount of effort to making sure, and, and it's an ongoing journey, but we all know that the biggest challenge in accessibility isn't actually WordPress, it's convincing the users of WordPress to fill out alt tags and to have the correct color contrast and all the challenges that come to creating great products. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in AI to fill a lot of those gaps that humans aren't interested in spending the time on. Yeah, we were discussing yesterday that when you need to write the alt tag for an image, AI could do that automatically. Like Mid Journey, for example, most of you have used it to generate images, but you can also give it an image and it will describe the image for you. So after that, you can use that description and fill it automatically. And that's been around for years, so it's not something new. 
So in terms of accessibility, I think that that's going to be also a revolution because it can give you a checklist of things that you haven't done and propose, let me do those for you automatically. Do you want to change something here? Because it knows that they are not pretty much done. Yeah, I mean, there's plugins out there that are already starting to do this with varying degrees of success. I know the Yoast team's probably working on stuff like this. Uh, I know Classif AI from, from uh, TenUp already does a lot of this type of work. And so I think we're getting to the point where there will be solutions out of the box. I just like to see that in core. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see why that has to be a third party solution. Yeah. That feels like some WordPress should do in terms of democratizing and making it really accessible. Um, is there, what about, I mean, I, search and personalization. Like I, I, one of my critiques of WordPress has always been that our search is behind lots of other solutions that exist in the world. Um, where, where do we go in terms of just making it really easy to find and understand things. Are you, do you have any active projects or work? I know we've got stuff. Well, the thing that we've tried with search because our knowledge base and tutorials are based on WordPress and we're pretty much using it as a headless platform is that when you put AI in there, it's very difficult to measure. And the other thing is that it's kind of slow because we're not just trying to give you here is a link of your search like that post. We're trying to correlate that information to the user to see if that's the best result. And it gets sluggish at this time. You know how if you're using right now GPT-4, for example, it's much slower than 3.5. And I think that if it needs to be done properly, it needs to be part of core, as you said, because if you're just pinging a third party API for that, it's gonna be even slower. So I don't have the vision to, to tell you how it's gonna work, to be honest, because it can be obviously part of WordPress itself, but the foundation needs to be laid there. And I think that those language models, the large language models that we are querying right now, years from now, that will be a commodity. Like, you won't have to go to OpenAI specifically or BART. There will be so many open source uh, models that you can run on commodity hardware. So on every single server which is running a WordPress website, you will have a decent model which can do that for you. And we're already seeing that with the release of Meta's latest uh, model, which had to be released slowly, but it kind of leaked. Right now, people are innovating super quickly and building things on top of it. And I think that's gonna be the future in a couple of years. Like, you will have a language model running on every single server, and it's gonna be local for that server, and it's gonna work well for specific tasks. I mean, that's, that's how, like, if you think of something like WooCommerce or BigCommerce, yes. you know, as a shop owner, the ability to go in and be like, Hey, what are my top selling products? Yeah. And I don't like have to query or find something hard to find. And I don't remember what that product, like a natural language experience to get reports. Surface it right away. That would be so awesome. That would yeah. be amazing. I want somebody build that for me. Oh yeah. And then implement, <laughs> like really act on it too. <laughs> what is the best selling product? Um, do I need to like do inventory management? You can use AI for that too. Just my inventory, just my pricing, all that. That's really something super cool. I think it gets interesting when you mix that and the first conversation we had around site building. Yes. So if you can get to the point where you have a, a co-pilot AI, an agent that can look at how your data is performing, your shop's performing, and be like, hey, here are our top three pages. Let's rejigger those. Let's run three, you know, you, know, you were talking about the feed AI, uh, AI yes. and, and so that, that can do multi, you know, and, and some of that, that can do multivariate tests. Yes. And there's no reason you as a human need to figure these out. Like the, if you've got, you know, like Cadence will have the ability to build out full pages for you now. And so if you could basically tie that in to the, take that AI and say, hey, every period of time, look at the performance, try something experiment with it, see if this has a better result. Uh, and that result doesn't have to be financial, although obviously that, that's an easier thing to measure. Um, so last, as a, as a wrap up to respect our time, uh, we've, we've talked about some things that are being built, some, some wishes. 
What are you hoping over the next year that, that either people in this room, that the community watching online, that the community builds, either in core or as independent products? Like, what kind of solutions are you looking forward to seeing? No, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important is we're having a very in-depth conversation with a lot of you who understand AI and how it fits into our lives, but I think the majority of the population has not adopted it yet. So I think it's very important to help the community, help everyone inside, outside adopt AI better, so making it more accessible for them, making it more of a commodity so that we can become more innovative as a society. Um, but I think, and I can't take credit for this, this is something our chief product officer said, is that currently we're looking at AI to replace functions that we are performing ourselves. So we're looking for AI to make our lives easier, to improve our workflow, but I think the next step is understanding what does AI empower us to do that we could have never done before, that we could have never even imagined before, and I think that's where things become very, very interesting, and I would want to see more of that. Take. Yeah, so we people usually overestimate what we can do for one hour, for one year, and underestimate what we can do for 10 years. So, Still waiting for my self-driving car. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have two answers for that question. The first one is the professional one. Obviously, we've discussed how AI will help the end users build their own websites with just requests, like I want a church website, I want a contact form, and it just picks it up for you and builds it. The next step is actually using an agent to help you run your business. Like, let's give an example with the e-commerce. Like, give me a report of the best-selling products. Suggest three things that I can do to sell more. Or give me analysis of something. And after that, not just that, but give it a goal. And it iterates in order to achieve that goal. So that's the professional thing. And my personal wish is that the AI should be able to do my taxes for me and deal with the government because that's a whole shit of work. WordPress is on it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> if, it's powered, if it's powered by WordPress, immediately you get 40% coverage of everyone on Earth. So. <laughs> um, God, you stole my answer. Uh, so I'm going to skip to you while I think. I mean, to be really honest, for any of you who've worked with business intelligence tools, they're painful. You know, and even like Google Analytics, like the average person to go in there and actually get any insight out of it is really hard. It's pages and pages and numbers and queries and not, I don't want that. I just want to have a conversation. And so like, honestly, I would love to see our community start to build tools, whether it's in the e-commerce space or whether it's in the content space that looks at how my community is engaging, looks at my content, looks at my stuff and says, hey, try this, or hey, we've noticed that, you know, if you're a plugin owner, uh, all your sites that have WooCommerce and have your plugin at this have these characteristics, you might want to put more focus on this part of your product and can create insights that allow you to create better solutions. Like that, to me, would be transformative. Oh, totally agree. You took part of my answer. Yeah, with the community, for me, like, there's two, like, looking in e-commerce at a shop. Yeah, I would love to have that kind of AI that really optimizes my stores, tells me from the beginning this is what I need, does it, analyzes, improves, optimizes it, maybe even have that automatic translation into a different language. So I have a store in English. Okay, have AI launch the same one in, you know, Spain, Greece. That would be awesome for community, because we work a lot with community develop community feedback. It is super hard to get the right sentiment, get the right data. And Whoa. I so agree, Power BI, not to say anything bad, but it's a difficult tool. And so it would be super cool just to have AI overall analyze the community sentiment, the community feedback aggregated, and provides recommendations on improvement on and maybe even helps us uh, yeah react to a lot of that and optimize love that and for me for me as a business owner like we use uh, so many tools in our business it starts with a wordpress website contact form lms analytics crm and the list can just go on right so for me, it would be awesome if uh, there is a, just a Slack bot or some sort of an AI tool where I could just ask question and get insights for my business, right? Now I have to like 
open that page, visit that website, click 10 tabs and open 10 things and find that number, right? So wouldn't it be awesome if I could just say, hey, how many visitors did I uh, get for my this website in the last 24 hours or something like that? I mean, it, realistically, like even just to sit, like we were talking about search. If there was a native AI interaction with the content in a WordPress, like I broke my leg three months ago and I had to go through a whole conversation in chart to just figure out how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And all the answers, I didn't need a human to tell me, they were all buried in a, you know, in a Corbin manual. It would have been great if I could have just gone to a chatbot and be like, broke my leg, what do I do? Oh, well, you're gonna, we'll actually screw it. We'll fill out the forms for you, don't worry about it. You know, we'll get you, how much PTO do you need? Doctor says three weeks, okay, filed for you, all good. Like, I think there are opportunities for it to take data that's accessible, which we all have in, in an internal wiki, and act on it as a simple agent internally and make our lives better. So with that, uh, there are a ton of sessions over the next day and a half, today and tomorrow, uh, on, on how to leverage AI for accessibility, for block building, for um, go mob them, learn, experiment, get like real creative. I think the biggest thing we don't know today is what's actually even possible yet. We're, we're in just pure discovery phase within this, but uh, you're gonna get really surprised. So that, thank you.